Uh, okay, so last time I walked you through an example of, uh, of a case where we're modeling individual binary data using a logistic regression model. I'm going to start out today uh, modeling similar kind of data, except that in this case, imagine that what you've observed is instead of looking at individual binary data, you're looking at uh, you're looking at information about uh, either number of patients or fraction of patients uh, in whom an, a particular event occurred, and we're going to want to model that. Uh, it's a situation we often encounter in, if we're looking, say, at summary data from, from the literature, if we're doing uh, some sort of meta-analysis, for example, where uh, we may get summary data in the form of fraction, percent, or number of patients that experience a particular event, like an adverse event. So let's uh, take a look at how we'd handle that kind of data. And in fact, it turns out that in terms of the underlying model, it's not fundamentally different, at least in the, uh, the core aspects of the model. So let's go ahead and uh, let me bring this up full screen. Uh, let's see, I'm getting a mention that the audio is much worse than last time, mostly too low in volume. Uh, okay, let me take a look at my settings here. Okay, let's see, the basic input volume seems to be set high. Uh, let's see, what am I missing here? Interestingly enough, the uh, the histogram I've got on go to meet go to webinar seems to indicate that the volume is high. Uh, let's see, anybody uh, curiosity, anybody stateside here, Joe? Uh, what kind of volume are you getting? Is Joe online? that matter any comments from anyone else uh, so far I've got a comment from one individual saying there's an audio problem uh, anybody else are you having audio difficulties low volume or distortion or anything like that of course that could just mean you're not hearing me at all <laughs> okay, well, I'm still getting it from uh, uh, from you, Andreas. Anybody else out there? Are we getting? Apparently, you're getting some audio, uh, but how about the rest of you? And I guess what I'm asking is to respond in the uh, in the questions section for the go to webinar control panel. Okay. Uh, might want to check your setup, Andreas. Uh, it looks like uh, others are indicating that they've got uh, good audio connections. In fact, let me reply this way in case you're not hearing me. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on here, uh, and assuming it's, I'm going to guess it's something local to Andreas' setup. So, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is what I'm terming here a binomial model for summary data. Uh, so the comment here you see is that a sum of 0, 1 Bernoulli distributed data items, in other words, binary data items, is actually a binomially distributed random variable. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, yes, I did, Joe. Or at least almost. It's uh, almost pegged. Okay, and Joe says it sounds fine to him, too. Okay. Uh, we'll keep on going. Okay, so when we've got our 0, 1 binary data items, if we just sum those up, uh, the resulting sum is binomially distributed. Uh, in other words, uh, we can talk in terms, uh, if we talk about that sum as being x here, then we were talking about x successes in n trials, uh, which is a very much a description of uh, a, a set of Bernoulli trials uh, that are modeled as a binomial distribution. Uh, and again, in this case, I'm using the term here, one, to be synonymous with the term success. So in this case, then, the probability of such a success or the probability of one is modeled in the same manner as it is for a binary variable, and the only difference is in the final likelihood function. Oh, I just remembered something I wanted to do here. Just a moment. Ah, oh, there it is. That's what I wanted to do. Okay, excuse me. Okay, and see what that looks like. So let's take a look at an example uh, and use that as the basis for talking about this. Uh, and the example I'm going to talk about is we're going to look at a dose response model for uh, reports of nausea during treatment with desvenlafaxine, uh, brand name Pristique. Uh, and what I've got here is data for nausea, the, in other words, the incidence of nausea reported in the Pristique package insert. So you can see here we've got dose number of patients reporting nausea, total number of patients, and the percent reporting nausea. Uh, we've got the different dose levels, 0, 50, 100, 200, and 400. And you can see here the numbers of patients reporting nausea going up, uh, and uh, the total number of patients here, and actually probably what's more relevant is the percent reporting nausea. That's clearly going going up with dose. And in the next slide here is just giving you a graphical representation of the same data. So I'm plotting fraction of patients reporting nausea on the x, I'm sorry, on the y-axis against dose on the x. And you can see there's a pretty clear rise in that. Uh, we're, I'm going to go ahead and use a logistic regression model for this. So I also plotted that as the logit of that fraction of patients with nausea. And again, we look at it over here. Uh, and one thing that's fairly apparent on viewing that is a linear logistic regression model for uh, for that fraction as a function of dose uh, doesn't appear to be appropriate since we've clearly got some some sort of decrease in, the, decrease in the rate of rise as we go to higher doses. So one could imagine something like an Emax model or something of the sort. Uh, what I'm going to use is something actually a little bit you know, simpler, albeit an empirical uh, model here, uh, and I've described it right here. So we're going to use a nonlinear logistic regression model for nausea occurrence. Uh, and in the ith dose, dose group is a function of dose. Uh, so I'm going to have N sub nausea sub I then represents the number of patients in the ith dose, dose group reporting nausea. Uh, and that is now going to be distributed according to a binomial distribution. Uh, we've got two parameters in there. We've got the probability of nausea in the ith dose group. And are actually not really, well, it's parameters of that distribution. Uh, and then the N sub I, which is just a fixed quantity here for the number of the total number of patients in the ith dose group. Uh, the model I'm going to attempt here is going to be to describe the logit of the probability of nausea as a linear function of dose raised to some power. So alpha plus beta times dose raised to some power gamma here. So it's just a sort of empirical uh, nonlinear model. Of course, you could also attempt uh, something like a uh, an Emacs model, though I suspect since the data doesn't get very close to the asymptote that you'll probably find that you'll have some estimation problems with that. But you could take a crack at it. 
Okay, so again, N sub nausea is the number of patients reporting nausea in that group. N is the total number of patients in the group. Uh, and for we're going to use a Bayesian, uh, Bayesian tool for this, so we have to specify prior distributions. And for this example, I'll again use very weakly informative priors. So I've just got alpha and beta are both just very flat normals here, normal zero uh, with a variance of a million. Uh, and for gamma, I bounded that one uh, just to keep things from sort of blowing up on us numerically. Uh, so I'm going to go from allow it to go from 0.1 to 10. I guess it's arguable to the extent to which you could say that that is uh, uh, that is weakly informative. But I'd probably argue it's given what the shape of the curve. You could argue that's pretty weakly informative. Okay, here's a uh, a Winbugs implementation of that, and if you compare it again to the model I just showed you, you can see it's pretty much uh, a, represent, a direct representation of that, uh, but dealing with the idiosyncrasies of Winbugs. So again, everything's inside of a model block, you know, delimited by the uh, brackets. Uh, then, as we step over our observations, in this case, observations meaning the uh, summary data for each uh, each dose group. So n obs in this case corresponds to the number of dose groups. Our likelihood function then is we just have n nausea for the ith dose group. Uh, that's distributed, and again that's why we got the uh, tilde for that. And according to a binomial distribution, and in WinBugs the binomial distribution is specified as d bin. Uh, and we have our probability of nausea in the ith group and the total number of patients, our n total in the ith group. Uh, and then our p nausea, our probability of nausea then is described in terms of our logistic regression models. Again on the left hand side I say logit p nausea in the ith group. Uh, and then on the right hand side we've got our intercept, our, our slope, and uh, this is a reminder here that in WinBugs there is no exponentiation operator but there is an exponentiation function which is called POW, presumably short for power. So that what this uh, this bit of syntax means then is uh, it's going to take dose i and raise it to the power gamma. And so that's really the the core of our, our model, of our likelihood. Uh, and then down here, we specify the uh, the prior distributions, and uh, and here. So again, we've got our alpha is going to be normal zero, and it's going to have a variance of a million or a precision of one over a million, or ten to the minus six. Same thing for beta, and then for the gamma. Recall, I used a uniform distribution, which is just called DUNIF in WinBugs, and it goes from a lower bound of 0.01 to an upper bound of 10. So that's going to be the model we're going to use. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and implement that. And let's uh, remind you here we're going to go uh, go to our our Windows uh, compute server here. Let me fire up remote desktop. It's going to go to our good old COMP2 Metrum Institute. Okay, uh, so we go in here. Let me open up a Explorer window here. Okay, what happened to Bill? I thought I usually put it there where I could see it. Okay, well, we'll get there this way. Okay. Hey, am I 255? So when you finally wander down in your 255 directory, uh, and you'll find this uh, in your own uh, in your own directory also here, uh, is you'll find an example that's referred to as binomial example. If you go in there. Uh, you'll find a couple of files. There's an R script, binomial example R, and a text file here, binomial example dot text, which is uh, uh, which is going to be our WinBugs bugs 
model here. Let me go ahead and grab that and pull it in so we can see it there. Uh, and here it is, and you'll see this is actually the same as what I just showed you in the slide, other than uh, I didn't include the comments in this instance to embellish it. Uh, but this is the same model we were looking at before. Uh, let me go ahead and fire up R, because just like we did for the binary example last time, we're going to uh, glue everything together using using R. Okay, and let's see, binary example. Let's pull that guy up. Oh, this thing was supposed to have changed the, just a moment here, let me uh, change the font size to make it easier to see. Oh, it does say 14. Well, let me make it a little bigger then. Okay, and let me know if you have any trouble seeing that where you are. Hopefully it's visible. Okay, what you'll find is the R script I've got here is very similar to the one I showed you for uh, uh, for the binary example. Uh, before, a lot of this is some boilerplate uh, to take care of things like path names and so on. Uh, the one thing that, uh, for instance, when you build your own uh, build your own examples you want to change would be your the name that I have here for model name so in this case it's binomial example uh, in some instances you may have to change your choice of libraries and you'll find those down in this section here uh, most of the rest of this should pro you can in most cases you'll be able to leave alone on top there so most of the uh, path names and that can stay intact. Let's go down here to uh, where we're building the the data. In this case I did not include a data file that has to be read in. Instead I've put the data, uh, I've hard-coded it right into the example here. So that's what you see uh, in this section right here. Uh, so you can see uh, it's creating a data frame where I'm putting in the percent nausea uh, and these should be the same values that were in the table uh, that I had showed you in the slides and uh, sorry and dose uh, and the total number of patients essentially this is just lifting the values right from the uh, that Pristique package insert uh, and then I since we're going to be using not the fraction or percent of patients as our dependent variable, we're going to be using the number of patients uh, because that's what we need in the f to get it in the form suitable for the binomial distribution. Uh, calculate the number of patients right here uh, based upon the percent and the total number of patients. So it's just basically converting percent to fraction, multiplying that by the per by the, uh, uh, the sorry taking converting the percent to fraction uh, and then multiplying it by the total number of patients and rounding it off so I'm dealing with integers and that'll give me my n nausea values which are the dependent variable in our likelihood. Uh, then I put those all together in a list form that we're going to be passing the wind bugs, uh, generate a set of initial estimates. Uh, in this case you can see I've got uh, a couple of things going on here. I've got my alpha and beta uh, are both normals using values more or less eyeballed from the uh, uh, from from the curves I was looking at. You could probably come up with better ones and refine them based upon just some fairly simple re regressions on the on that data. Uh, but this is a simple enough model and a simple enough set. You can probably get away with pretty bad initial estimates and not get into too much trouble. Uh, similarly for the uh, gamma, our, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the exponent here, uh, all I've done here is 
uh, just come up with something from a uniform distribution and all I'm doing is pulling numbers between 0.25 and 2 for my initial estimates. So it's going to be doing three chains like I've done in the past and each chain will have a different set of initial estimates generated by those random number generators. Uh, the parameters that we're going to want to look at are going to be that intercept slope and and uh, exponent it's our alpha beta and gamma so uh, that's where I tell the those are the parameters to plot uh, in addition uh, actually let me step back to the model the one thing I skipped over is uh, is one line in our model here this one right here which notice on the right hand side it's actually identical to the likelihood which is right there uh, the difference being that on the left hand side uh, the value this n nausea pred uh, is that is now going to be a predicted value whereas the n nausea is actually observed data and nausea pred will be predicted uh, by simply sampling from the uh, from the likelihood uh, so we're going to so and we can use that then for simple uh, model fitting diagnostics so we're going to want to collect that in addition sometimes it's interesting to also collect the uh, the probability of nausea terms here so that's why you see in other RVs here I've added the n nausea pred and the p nausea and those all get combined down in these last two statements here uh, to create the full set that we're going to monitor uh, then we've got our business end down here of the stuff so you can see I've got I'm um, going for three chains each chain is going to be 100,000 iterations uh, I'm throwing away 10,000 iterations from each one of those chains and I'm going to thin by 50 uh, so I guess I'd have to sit down and calculate how many you get left over let's see uh, what is that I guess that would be uh, some what is that like 1800 I think for each chain that we'll be collecting so whatever three times that is uh, what is that 54,000 something like that so that's that's what we'll be keeping in the end uh, the bugs fit statement this bugs call here is should be identical to the one we used in the binary example the way I've set up the code is usually you don't have to monkey with that statement again other than maybe changing uh, these logicals for clear WD and debug uh, remind you again there if you actually want to do some uh, leave some room for doing some debugging I would change clear WD to false and debug to true okay uh, next few statements are our boilerplate for creating a directory with our model results in it uh, converting the format of the data to something that I find easier to use for doing some of our plots and so on in uh, the next few statements down here uh, opening up a uh, PDF file to hold our plots uh, getting the subset of data that we want to actually uh, put in our summary table uh, down here we generate a summary table as well as a couple of the diagnostic plots and in this right CSV statement we write the table out to a file let's see I got a question here asking do I use any diagnostic any diagnostics to get the chain length and thinning or is this heuristic I uh, well sort of I guess the answer is yes uh, in other words both uh, are likely to play in there the um, for the thing well two things the the chain length uh, I the things I look at most for assessing that is you know in an initial run I will you know I'll start out with what seems like a plausible number so that's a pure heuristic uh, in any given case and but then I will look yeah you know, the Gelman Rubin Brooks plots might be one thing I'd look at I'll be honest I don't look at those as much as I just look at the history plots to try and make an assessment of whether or not uh, there are enough samples uh, and enough samples pertains to both whether or not 
convergence appears to have been achieved and you know in terms of a real heuristic whether or not that plot looks like a fuzzy caterpillar uh the other thing i look at and i'll point that out when we look at the results on this is an estimate of the effective n which is an estimate of the equivalent sample size of independent samples to see whether I've got what is a sample size large enough that it's likely to yield good precision in the parameters, at least the model parameters that I care about. Uh, so that's something I pay a fair amount of attention to. Uh, and particularly if effective n is relatively small, say something more in the tens or hundreds as opposed to the thousands, uh, depending upon what kinds of inferences I'm going to be making based on those parameters, then uh, then I might choose to do more samples. Uh, you know, similarly, if I look at uh, if there's a convergence problem, uh, I'm likely to also do more samples, or if it's a really severe convergence problem, I'm going to be exploring whether or not I need to do some modifications such as reparameterization to improve that. Okay, that has to do with the number of iterations. In terms of the thinning, thinning for, uh, I would argue that thinning isn't really determined so much by uh, most of those issues as much as it's determined by um, by basically how how many numbers you want to save and how much disk space you want to use up. Uh, there's no particular benefit in throwing away values by thinning except in reducing uh, the amount of memory or disk space that you're using. Uh, so, for example, if I chose not to do thinning for this example, to some degree, I might run into memory limitations in R. So, okay, let me wander past that here. So, uh, a little bit of an aside. And then the rest of this is, I think I do a few plots for, yeah, the rest of these are, are just some fairly simple diagnostics. Probably the best way to show them to you is actually to run this so that you can see what they look like. So let me go ahead and run it. Select the whole thing and launch it. Okay, and as usual it flies by. It opens up a, a bugs window. And we'll let that scoot along for a little bit. By the way, I would recommend that you go ahead and take, you know, even though I've tried to uh, to, in some, to some degree provide some boilerplate around some of the elements in the R scripts, uh, I certainly encourage you to sort of wander through them and uh, see if you can discern what's going on in, in various uh, components of it. And if you've got uh, specific questions about some of those, you know, f feel free to ask questions in the forums. Uh, it's probably the best place for um, for asking about that. Okay, it looks like it ran. Uh, if we scroll up, make sure we don't have any nasty errors. Let's see, what was that? There's, okay, let's see, what are those? Okay, those are benign errors there that we don't need to worry about. Nope, looks like everything ran fine. Let's go ahead and take a look at our, uh, what we got. You can see it created a uh, new directory here uh, inside the outer binomial example directory we open that up you'll see we've got a number of file a number of PDF files which are the plots that were created Go ahead and fire those up okay the top one that you see here I should go ahead and make that a little bigger okay uh, so that's the history plots I was speaking of uh, you can see here that uh, I think it's reasonable to argue that you're looking at some fairly nice fuzzy caterpillars there is no hint of convergence problems things are nice and horizontal there's no general trends uh, going on here um, the at least after I've done this much thinning there's not a whole lot of uh, 
uh, severe autocorrelation apparent, apparent in it, but if you were to look uh, in detail under the hood here, you'd see some, but by doing 100,000 iterations, we've avoided any really substantial problems there. I sus can't remember now, but as I recall, when you do only say 10,000 or so on this, uh, they, there's some that are apparent uh, that that would have argued you want to do more samples. We'll take a look at the effect of N in a minute, but it'll give us a handle on that too. So we got that. Let's see what else we got. Uh, actually, before we look at the predictions, let's uh, the gelman rubin Brooks, Brooks plots were mentioned. That's what we've got right here. Okay, and again, what you're looking for here is you're looking for these things to pretty much converge down to something very close to one. How close is close is, uh, I guess, uh, you know, you certainly want to see them going down below 1.05 uh and preferably less than that in this case by the time we did 10,000 we're well down below that so again these these are generally used as convergence diagnostics and from these there there's certainly no convergence problems evident from what we're looking at in this case oops that's not what i wanted to do oh cut that out there we go Bring them back up. Uh, well, this plot here you can kind of ignore. That was just done to to do a plot of the data before the fitting was done. Uh, let's see. This plot is looking at the an estimate of the uh, marginal posterior distributions of of the various parameters. So you can see. Okay, get rid of that. Uh, so we can see our intercept slope here and our exponent uh, described there. So you can certainly see you can interpret those pretty readily. You can see how, for example, the uh, intercept here is centered somewhere oh, around minus 2.3, minus 2.2, uh, and spread roughly between minus 0.26 and minus 0.18. And you can make similar uh, statements around here, beta around 0.3, uh, gamma also uh, eh, 0.3 or thereabouts uh, as part of this. So just kind of visualization on those posterior distributions. And then finally we get a set of posterior predictions here compared to the observed data. <coughs> Now, I put the posterior predictions not in terms of the dependent variable we were modeling, which was the number of patients with nausea. I put it in terms of the fraction of patients, which is probably, you know, which is more closely related to the underlying probability that we modeled. Uh, and you can see how uh, that fraction is going up with dose. And, and you can see, in this case, I've plotted 90% credible intervals about that. So the blue curve is the median. Uh, the lower, uh, ha the lower red curve here is uh, the fifth percentile. The upper is the 95th percentile of the posterior predictions. Uh, so you can see how that's pretty well picked up the data. Right-hand side is the same thing, but now expressed as the logit of the fraction of patients. So that's a more direct representation of that underlying uh, linear function of the uh, dose raised to a power. So that's pretty much the story on the plots. Let me go ahead and open up the uh, data summary here. Okay, opening. At least I think it's opening. Oh, it was hiding behind. Okay. Okay, let's make that a bit bigger. So where are we going? Okay, so it would improve lung function. Uh, the primary efficacy endpoint in the confirmatory trials will be the occurrence of pulmonary exacerbations. Uh, and a pulmonary exacerbation is defined in a variety of ways in the literature, but it usually refers to 
a deterioration of pulmonary function that requires some sort of an intervention, uh, such as hospitalization, administration of intravenous antibiotics, or in administration of oral antibiotics. Uh, in the METRIM trials, acute pulmonary exacerbations were defined as an acute exacerbation of cystic fibrosis respiratory symptoms that in the opinion of the patient's physician required administration of new oral or intravenous antibiotics. Uh, some secondary endpoints here and some biomarkers will include pulmonary function measurements like FEV1 uh, and sputum viscosity. And our hands-on examples are going to involve the analysis of some results from clinical trials in phases two and three. Uh, though the just the caveat here, the order of the examples that we'll do won't won't necessarily follow the chronological order of the development program. They're they're chosen just to uh, to fit the kind of uh, endpoints we're looking at, whether they be you know categorical or ordinal or time to event and so on. Okay, and here's the examples that fit into that. Uh, for our hands-on problem one, it's going to be logistic regression for binary data. Uh, in this case, it's just going to be a dose-response model for exacerbation occurrence within 24 weeks. Uh, and then hands-on two is going to be looking at some longitudinal binary data. Uh, actually, we'll be talking a bit about that next week, uh, but what we'll find is when dealing with such longitudinal binary data, we're now going to be going to a mixed effects model uh, to deal with that. Uh, and for hands-on problem two, we'll be looking at repeated measures uh, for adverse events. In this case, it's going to be uh, reports of coughing. Uh, and, and this is in phase two, uh, and the repeated measures means what they'll do is they count up, or not, let's see, I guess it's not, yeah, this is binary, so it won't be counting up. They'll just be reporting whether or not uh, the coughing was reported for each one of these intervisit periods. Uh, then here we'll make it a little more interesting, and in that uh, it's believed that the team... Uh, or the team believes that patients will exhibit some sort of tolerance for that particular adverse event. Uh, in other words, for a given drug exposure, the adverse event will occur less frequently over time, and we're going to explore that by fitting a longitudinal binary model uh, to that adverse event data that was seen in, the, uh, in a dose-response study using a model where the probability of an adverse event can decline with time. And that's going to be used to assess the strength of the evidence supporting that tolerance hypothesis. And it could also then be used to explore the effects of maybe a dose escalation re regimen to reduce the actual AE incidence. Uh, Hands-on three, we're now going to be looking at longitudinal ordinal data, in other words, ordered categorical data. Uh, in this case, it's going to be uh, the dependent variable is going to be a quality of life, life score, which will just be a three-point scale. Uh, Hands-on problem four, uh, we're going to be looking at count data, uh, and this is going to be the number of coughing events in a phase two study, and we're going to look at a range of, of count models, and uh, and that'll also give us a chance to uh, to learn something about using model evaluation and selection strategies with uh, with these kinds of models and using Bayesian methods. Uh, for hands-on problem five, uh, and that's when we're going to be that's uh, after we've started in on time to event data. Now uh, we're going to start out with uh, one of the simplest types of time to event models, namely a constant hazard hazard model. On uh, the scenario we're looking at here is that hey we've got a follow on to ME2, ME3. Uh, it's also a mucolytic uh, being developed for treating cystic high, sorry cystic fibrosis, uh, and the scenario is one where phase one trials are in progress. And so the current focus will then be on the design of phase two proof of concept and dose finding. Uh, the development team's preferred primary endpoint for efficacy is time to the first pulmonary exacerbation, but trials using conventional hypothesis tests require large sample sizes and or durations in order to achieve adequate statistical power. Uh, and in particular, they, you know, 
they would require either more time or larger sample sizes than uh, than you might like for a phase two program. Uh, the approach we're going to take to try and alleviate that is uh, we'll develop a model that relates FEV1 to exacerbation uh, uh, based upon meta-analysis of results from the past ME2 trials uh, plus some summary data for other mucolytics and actually we're not going to do that we're actually going to assume that's been done and we're going to use that information as the basis to construct some informative prior distributions uh, for analyzing the ME3 data so that's where the argument is in the next bullet here so it says it may be possible to reduce sample sizes or trial duration for those phase two proof of concept and dose finding trials by analyzing both exacerbation and FEV1 data in the same patients using a joint model that incorporates that aforementioned model relating FEV1 to hazard uh, exacerbation hazard uh, and we'll include informative prior distributions that resulted from the previous work done with ME2 uh, and so that would then permit inferences regarding exacerba exacerbations conditioned on prior knowledge and the observed FEV1 and pulmonary exacerbation data for ME3. Uh, and so as you can see here, I say, based on this idea, the team conducted a study with fewer patients and half the treatment duration, in other words, 12 weeks instead of 24, uh, and for a, anyway, yeah, sorry, 12 instead of 24, and we're going to analyze those results in the hands-on example. Okay, that was rather long-winded. And finally, problem six has us digging into a repeated, some repeated time to event data. Uh, and in particular, we're going to model not just time to the first pulmonary exacerbation, but we're going to, we're going to model the times between all of the pulmonary exacerbations uh, that are reported. Okay, so that's that's the storyline we're going to be following for many of the examples we're going to go through in the course. And what I'll do now here before I let you loose is uh, is describe uh, a hands-on example that we'll then go over on Thursday, uh, but that I'd like you to try before we get there. Uh, so let me um, give you the the basics for that. Uh, so it's going to scenarios. We have a phase two dose finding trial in cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, it's a parallel design. Uh, there's a hundred patients per dose arm. Uh, there are multiple doses of uh, of ME2. Uh, in particular, we've got placebo, 20, 40, and 60 milligrams per day administered by inhalation for 24 weeks. Uh, the primary efficacy measurements measurement will be the occurrence of greater than or equal to one pulmonary exacerbation event within 24 weeks. So in other words, the, uh, some patients will have no exacerbation and some patients will have one or more exacerbations. And we're going to treat the data in tar as, you know, either they had, an exa they had at least one exacerbation or they didn't. So it'll just be binary. Uh, some covariants that might be relevant include age, baseline FEV1, uh, con some concomitant medications, in particular uh, RHD and ACE, or uh, chronic antibiotic treatment. Uh, the hands-on exercise is then to construct a model for occurrence of pulmonary exacerbation as a function of dose and possibly one or more of these patient-specific covariates. Uh, in the... Um, uh, in the course materials you've got, you'll find there's a uh, directory called Hands-On 1. Uh, there'll be a file in there called me2exacerbationdata.csv, so that's the data set you're going to be working with. Uh, this is just gives you a visualization of some of that data. So we've got on our y-axis here is the fraction of patients reporting uh, at least one pulmonary exacerbation versus dose. Uh, the two curves are broken, the patients are broken out by those that did not or did receive uh, chronic antibiotic treatment. Uh, and you can see, uh, see in here, there's a 
uh, at least some trend downward with dose in terms of the fraction with exacerbations and you can see those with chronic antibiotics uh, tend to have fewer although you end up with a little bit of ambiguity because of whatever is going on here at 60 milligrams so but on the other hand you can see the error bars are pretty broad here so uh, so that is arguably within the realm of uh, of being a, a random occurrence uh, with the RHDNA, a similar pattern here, though even more ambiguous uh, in this instance. Uh, this is uh, plots here now with here instead of taking the fractions of patients here, I've, though I've called it fraction of patients, it's actually uh, you're looking the symbols are actually individual results which are either zeros or ones. In other words, the zeros are those patients who had no exacerbation and the ones are patients who had at least one exacerbation. And the curves here are, uh, these are sort of uh, local logistic regressions, if you like. They're, they're smoothers through uh, smoothing approaches for dealing with binary data. Uh, and if you look at these, the, the patterns are kind of pretty ambiguous here. Oh, should mention the different panels correspond to different dose levels, uh, 0, 20, 40, and, and 60, 60 milligrams uh, per day here. Uh, so you can see eh, the patterns, they aren't real obvious patterns here. Uh, similar is true for age. Uh, this just brings up a, a potential issue in here, and that's that age and FEV1 are uh, are pretty heavily correlated here. So you could argue those are kind of uh, there's a lot of collinearity if you uh, if you choose to use both as covariates in here. And this isn't entirely surprising since we're dealing with a disorder, cystic fibrosis, where uh, over time, uh, lung function would be going down, uh, and unfortunately with cystic fibrosis it goes down at uh, relatively early ages here. Uh, then I give you, uh, for the exercise here, I give you a couple of proposed models uh, for two different cases. Uh, and I suggest you go ahead and do both as a way to explore using both the binomial and the Bernoulli distributions in here. The first one is uh, to construct a base model uh, where, uh, where instead of using the individual data, you use summary data. Uh, so we're talking about taking the number of patients in the ith dose arm that have uh, pulmonary exacerbation. Uh, and so that's represented here as n exact i here, uh, and that would be binomially distributed, and to uh, and describe that as a function of dose here. In this case, just described it as a linear function of dose. Uh, so that would be a you know sort of a simple approach to deal with the summary data. Now that's really only applicable in the case where we're uh, where we're sort of constructing this base model before we add the patient specific covariates in here. And then the next stage would be to go to our binary full model uh, where now I'm going to do that same linear logistic regression model but we're going to incorporate the patient specific covariates and in particular we're going to be bringing in in addition to dose the baseline FEV1 uh, and uh, whether or not they're on chronic antibiotics uh, or uh, RHDNAs and also will bring in age. Uh, so now we're going to have just an indicator variable for whether or not the patient had a uh, an exacerbation. That's now going to be Bernoulli distributed. Uh, and the model here starts out with that same base model but now incorporates all of our covariates in here. And for both of these I suggested just using very weakly informative priors as part of this. Okay, and if you, one suggestion in here is probably on the first pass you might want to just go ahead and use the R scripts which are already provided. So let me actually go back down to, uh, let me close that. 
Uh, if you go into your MI255 directory, uh, you'll see there is a hands-on one folder. Uh, there's several files. One is the data file that I already spoke of. Uh, but in addition, there is a this text file, which is a um, which is the WinBugs model and an R script. Uh, my suggestion, depending on how much uh, you know how much effort you want to put into it, uh, first suggestion would be to you know move, rename, do something to basically get rid of the uh, of the WinBugs model. Don't look at it and go ahead and try to build it on your own. Uh, but just go but go ahead and use the existing R script rather than try to construct that from scratch. Uh, on the other hand, if you really want to challenge yourself, you can go ahead and try to construct that from scratch. Maybe using the uh, binary example and binomial example uh, cases as as templates to build from. So that that would also be a possibility. But in particular, I recommend. Uh, figuring out how to do the bugs model itself without looking at the result that's there. Okay, uh, I think, let me just see before I move on, any any questions? Let's see, so far nothing's popping up. I'll stay on for a, another minute or two and see if something does. Um, but in the meantime, that's uh, that's where I was going to uh, stop for today. Uh, Thursday we'll go over uh, this hands-on one example. Uh, and then on the, the following Monday we're going to kick off on uh, this section here about model evaluation, uh, and which we'll focus on as I say here, simulation-based approaches for categorical data models. So uh, I guess until Thursday, uh, have fun playing with uh, your first hands-on example. I uh, look forward to any questions you might have uh, about that. Okay, bye for now.